church. The church is not a building. It is not a religion. It is not a place. It is a people connected in community to Christ. And we are all a little different. We dress differently. Act differently. Move differently. Think differently. Worship differently. Even sometimes believe differently. But despite our differences, we need each other. For just as one body has many members, so we, the body of Christ, has many members, but are still one. So join us as we discover how our differences make us better. We, 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 we are the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. And we're better together. Amen. Well, yeah, we're starting a new series this morning called Generations, and we're so glad that you guys chose to be with us. Today, as we kick off this series, we're excited about taking a look at different age groups, different generations, how we all meld together as one church. And how many know that it's our differences, it's our diversity that actually is a strength and it's a beautiful component of being the body of Christ? Amen? If we're all the same, if we all think the same, act the same, do the same, that gets pretty boring. And so I'm thankful that God has made each one of us unique with different perspectives and coming from different generations that as we meld together, it is a beautiful picture of the gospel at work, that unity in the midst of diversity. And so I'm glad that today, uh, here as we launch this series, it's Grandparents Day. And so I want to first of all say happy Grandparents Day to all the grandmas, grandpas, and then somebody even reminded me this morning, even great grandmas, great grandpas in the house. How many great grandmas or great grandpas? Raise your hand. We got a couple right there. They said they're all great. That's awesome. <clears throat> Brian's on it, man. Good job. That worship, how about that? Those guys are just killing it this morning. Did an amazing job. Fantastic. Our girls were blown away seeing Sarah on the drums. They're like, oh, I didn't know she could do that. You know, and so I'm lobbying next time just, you know, for, for shout to the Lord. We're going to get that one in there. Shout to the Lord. We've got, we've got to do it. And then a little enemies camp, you know, then you've got to do the whole medley. Look what the Lord has done and can you believe. And I'll be up here singing it with them, probably doing a jig and uh, stomping on the devil's head. I'm telling you what. And so I, I love that era. I love the era of the 90s and the two, early 2000s. And, and uh, it's just awesome just to go back and, and it's a little bit of nostalgic, you know, for me. So grandparents, we're so grateful for each and every one of you guys here today. Uh, we love you. We bless you. We honor you today. And, uh, you know, I heard a story about a grandfather. And uh, he thought that maybe his wife's hearing was starting to go bad. And so uh, he got up behind her while she was sitting in her lounge chair one evening, and he spoke real softly to her, and he just said, hey, honey, can you hear me? And there was no answer, so he moved a little bit closer, and he said again, hey, honey, can you hear me? And still no answer, so he got right up behind her in her ear, and he says, honey, can you hear me? And she said, for the third time, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> and... Uh, some of you guys will get that one on the way out. <clears throat> but really, grandmas and grandpas, they're the best, aren't they? Grandmas, there's no, there's no substitute for grandmas and grandpas. And so while I only had the benefit of one grandparent growing up, uh, the, the mark that she made upon my life was indelible. Uh, and it continues with me to this day. And as somebody who is raised primarily by my grandmother, many of the ethics and family values that I carry today, they continue to influence me. I continue to hear her voice reverberating in my heart. And the impact she's made on my life will go uh, not just into, into my life, but it'll trickle down to my children and my children's children and on through the generations. And, uh, you know, she charts my course still today going forward as I look back at her footsteps, at the godly legacy that she left for me. And so I'm thankful for that today. And, and not just for those who, who have a, a physical grandma and grandpa, a natural one in your family. I'm, I don't want to be insensitive in this moment. I realize that there are some who maybe never had the benefit of a grandmother or a grandfather in your life. And so I want to recognize that as well. Um, but maybe you have been able to experience those older people in life around you who've just come along and put an arm around you, prayed for you, encouraged you, um, you know, those spiritual grandmas and grandpas in the faith. They are equally valuable today, and in fact, in many ways, more valuable, because for those of us that weren't raised in the faith, for those of us that didn't know Christ, when we have a seasoned saint who comes alongside of us, puts their arm around us, encourages us, prays for us, speaks into our life, that's something that we never had growing up. That's something we never had in our families, and so I'm telling you that spiritual grandmas and grandpas, you play a vital role in the church. You play a vital role in the family of God, and we need you to speak into us, and we're thankful for you 
and all of the deposits that you've made into our lives. You know, one of the greatest blessings for, for Megan and I starting out early um, we became parents early, we were married early, we became homeowners early, uh, has undoubtedly been an abundance of grandparents for our kids. Starting our family out early, we had an abundance, and we still have an abundance of grandparents for our kids. And um, while the great-grandparents and even one great-great-grandmother have now gone on to be with the Lord, our children still have, to this day, in, in their college years, four grandparents, wonderful grandparents in their lives, a nana, a papa, a grandma, and, I'm sorry, Grandpa and a Mima. And so whatever the special name is uh, in your family, there's just something really unique about the role that grandparents play in the family. Amen? And so how many of you ever heard the saying, respect your elders? You've heard that, right? Everybody's heard, respect your elders. You know, it's actually based in the Bible. Scripture tells us that we ought to respect our elders. It's not just some, some coined phrase that people use, but we actually draw it from the Word of God. In fact, our elders are the only generation that the Bible says specifically that we are to honor them, specifically our elder generation. And so why? Why is it important that we honor them? And, and I, I'm going to tell you, there's a younger generation that at a lot of points in, in culture and in church life, they're asking the question why. And that is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. We want people to understand the why and not just go along with the what. Because when we can get a hold of the why, when we have a deeper level of appreciation and understanding for honor, can I tell you, that's where real honor flows from, is out of a heart that desires to honor. But if we just get into the ritual and to the routine of just honor, respect, just do it because, it doesn't actually f flow from a heart of honor. It's just an outside act of obedience, of submission, but it's not an, a heart of honor. And if we want to cultivate a culture of honor, then we have to be able to answer that question, why? Why? And so write this down. To honor the aged is to honor the Lord. You really shouldn't need any more reason than that, right? To honor the aged is to honor the Lord. That as we honor our elders, as we, as we give them the honor that is due to them, and, and many worthy of double honor, we're honoring the Lord in that. It is an act of worship. Leviticus 19 and 32 says, Stand up in the presence of the elderly and show respect for the aged. Fear your God, I am the Lord. Stand up in the presence of the elderly. Show respect for the aged. Fear your God. I am the Lord. You know, one way we can know when a culture has lost its fear for the Lord is when it no longer honors and respects those that are older. And how many know that's, sadly, that is a culture that we find ourselves living in today. And depending on where you live and the circles you run in, you may find this to be more or less true. But I'm telling you that especially in some of our larger urban areas and different, different parts of our country, you're going to find this dishonor that runs deep. It runs deep. And so there is not the culture of honor that we once had in our society. More and more, our culture is sadly becoming one of dishonor. Scripture also teaches us that to honor the aged is to gain wisdom. Here's another reason why. It's to gain wisdom, that there's great benefit found in learning from those who are older than us. Job 12, 12, wisdom belongs to the aged and understanding to the old. So God says one of the smartest things you can do is to have a conversation with an older person. That's what he's saying there in Job 12, 12, that that's one of the smartest things you can do is to have a conversation with with an older person. There are things that we can glean through their experiences, through their wisdom, that we can never glean on our own. And so we have the, the, the benefit. I mean, can you imagine not having the benefit of, of older generations who've been there, done that, and learned things the hard way so that we don't have to? If we didn't have that, we'd be constantly running up against a brick wall. But I'm thankful that there are those in my life who say, oh, I've tried that. It doesn't quite work. You know, let me, let me speak into your situation and give you a little piece of advice because I've done that, right? And so I'm thankful that we have that. That's wisdom. It's smart to have a conversation with somebody who's older than us. One of the smartest things you can do is to learn from those who've gone before us, who've lived a life, and have more experience to draw from. Even atheists agree with this. It doesn't take being a believer to understand or appreciate this truth that older folks have great wisdom, great insight, great experience that we can glean from. It doesn't take being a super seasoned spiritual saint to recognize this. Even atheists understand it. Journalist Andy Rooney, a devout atheist, he said this, the best classroom in the world is sitting at the feet of an elderly person. The best classroom in the world. 
I can tell you, I spent some of, some of the most treasured moments in my life, especially as a believer, were sitting at the feet of my wife's grandfather, a retired Assemblies of God pastor, who had, had been through world wars and Great Depression and, and so many things in his life. And, and it was just a wealth, man, a wealth of knowledge. Sitting at his feet was just drinking from a fire hose of wisdom. It, amazing, amazing man of God. And uh, he, he's gone on to be with the Lord. He's sorely missed. But the impact that he has made upon my life in a few short years, I mean, it, it's unmistakable. And it continues with me and it will forever and ever. As one seasoned saint explained, old folks are worth a fortune. They have silver in their hair, gold in their teeth, stones in their kidneys, lead in their feet, and gas in their stomachs. I didn't say it. I'm just quoting them. Seriously, though, you've you've gone through a lot in your lifetimes, and many of you have survived wars and depressions. You've endured changes unlike anything any of us can imagine. Some of you went from Model Ts to space shuttles. Uh, Some of you have lived in the B.C. era before computers. Your grandkids can't believe you actually had a TV without a remote control. Some of you are going, we didn't have a TV, right? Uh, Somehow you survived without seat belts and airbags and automobiles. You grew up with prayer in schools and paddlings at home. You went to Sunday school, and that's why you know what a flannel graph is, right? You taught kids' classes. You led youth groups. You sung in the choir. You worked behind the scenes to make the church more effective. You sacrificed, you gave, you served, you survived a thousand changes in the church, and you've seen it all. You've lived a life of faith while many around you did not. You've lived to see the fruit of your faithfulness, and we honor you, we honor you, and more importantly, we honor the God that you've pointed us to for all these many years, and it's because of you that we sit here today. And so thank you. Can we give honor to to those who've gone before, to our grandmas and grandpas? Amen. Amen. We bless you. Thank you. In the book of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul writes the young pastor, Timothy, a letter of encouragement and spiritual direction. Um, Here he's thinking of Timothy's spiritual heritage and how a godly legacy was passed down from his grandmother to his mother and then on down to Timothy. And we pick this up in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first inst- was instilled in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. You see, Timothy inherited a spiritual mantle that could be traced back to his grandmother Lois and his his mother Eunice, great godly women. Can I just underscore that? Great godly women. Amen? There was a a legacy and there was a deposit made into young Pastor Timothy because of grandma and because of mom, because there were generations that came before him that, that took on the mantle and were willing to carry it and then to pass it on to the next generation. That's what it's about. It's about working together to leave a legacy. A heritage of faith and godliness is one of the greatest gifts that we can give to future generations. One of the absolute greatest gifts that you can ever give to the next generation is a heritage of faith and godliness. Verse 6 speaks of fanning into flames the gift of God, which isn't speaking about a physical gift that we can touch and hold, but a supernatural gift through spiritual osmosis that becomes a part of you. It's something that you can't buy. It's something that you can't learn. It's something you can't just acquire. It's something that is deposited in you supernaturally. And there's no doubt that people looked at how Timothy preached and believed and behaved and said things like, man, you sure can tell that he's Eunice's boy. You can see his mama all over him, right? Or, oh man, he reminds me of his grandma Lois and how he prays and intercedes for souls. There's a a generational legacy and deposit that was made into Timothy's life that people could see the deposit. They could see the influence, the mantle, that similar anointing that came down from generation to generation. The gift was a special gift, a powerful gift from the Holy Spirit that was passed down to Timothy and helped him in his pastorate. And the gift must be kept alive in us by prayer, obedience, and diligence. Man, I, 
I cannot underscore this enough. There is a gift that we receive, but we have to maintain that gift. We have to continue in prayer. We have to continue in obedience, doing the will of God. We have to continue in diligence to protect, to guard that precious gift that is inside of us, that anointing upon our life, the call of God upon you, that spiritual mantle and heritage that you carry with you. Maybe you're like me today and you don't have that heritage. I, I spoke to my, about my grandmother. Yes, she, she was a godly woman, but let me tell you, she wore her, her faith very, very quietly. She, she wore her spirituality very, very silently at most times. Uh, she didn't preach to me. She didn't read the Bible to me. She didn't pray with me. She attended church faithfully, and she was a quiet saint. But I can tell you, for those that I know who have had those major deposits of somebody speaking precious truth into their lives, praying desperate prayers over their grandchildren and their children, continually living out a witness of Jesus Christ before them, I mean, that's a whole nother level. You are blessed. If that's you today in the house and you had that, you have that in your life, man, you are blessed and highly favored. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, for those that don't know what that's like, we look to you and we say, man, you are so, so blessed. Don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever take that for granted. Many of you here this morning can look back to your parents and your grandparents and you can see how that spiritual mantle was passed down to you, a godly heritage. It's immeasurable in wealth and it should never be taken for granted, but it has to be valued and maintained in order to be kept alive in us. Listen, God wants us to take that spiritual mantle. He wants us to take that anointing that is upon our lives, that, that, that legacy that God wants to use our lives to leave. And he wants us to have something to leave as an inheritance, right, for our future generations, for our kids, for our grandchildren. What are you leaving? What are you leaving for your grandkids? What are you leaving for your kids? Has someone passed that mantle on to you? What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? We're not supposed to fumble the ball Amen? God wants us to carry that ball. He wants to take it across the finish line, and he doesn't want us to finish alone. When we run the, the race of the faith, when we are believers in the Lord Jesus, the race that we, that we run and the race that we ultimately win isn't one for us. We need to cross the finish line. We need to cross the, the end zone line with some other people with us. That's what it's about. It's about passing that legacy on. It's about making sure that other people finish well. And not just within our own natural families, but within the family of God. That as we look around this room, we see brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, grandmas and grandpas, spiritual children. And we say, man, we are a family. And we win together and we lose together. And when one of us is slipping, one of us is falling back, it's not time for me to just forge on. It's time for me to go back, grab their hand and say, come on, let's go. Let's finish strong. That's what it's about. It's about being a Eunice. It's about being a Lois. It's about being a Timothy and saying, it's not just about me. It's about generations, both ahead of me and behind me, and all of us pushing towards the goal, working together to leave a legacy. That's what it's about. You know, Paul told Timothy, fan the gift into flames. You see, the gift was like a fire that it might have been getting a little bit low in Timothy's life. And Paul was saying, it's time to get on fire again. It's time to get on fire again. You see, we're not talking about some little, you know, mamsy-pamsy faith that, that's, that's just cute and nice and, and gives you the goosebumps and it's warm and cozy. We're talking about a gospel that is powerful. We're talking about the good news that goes and transforms lives. We're talking about hope. We're talking about light in dark places. We're talking about living in a time of dishonor and bringing honor because we carry this mantle, because we appreciate those who've passed it on to us. You see, when you're, a, when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, honor becomes a part of your DNA because God is our Father and he is all about honor. And so when we become a child of God, we inherit that mantle from him. So even if you didn't have the natural grandma, grandpa, mother, father to pass that legacy down to you, I'm telling you, when you step into relationship with your heavenly father and you become a child of the king, all of a sudden there is that royal DNA that begins to get deposited into your life. And honor is a part of a royal DNA that God has instilled in his children. It's woven into the fabric of who we are, who he's made us to be. And so when we step forward in a time of darkness, in a time of dishonor, and we be light and we be honor, we demonstrate that, we are reflecting, we are radiating the glory of our God for people to see. 
It's not about bowing down and kissing the feet of people. It's about being Jesus who washed the feet of people and showing people how it's done that when they say that don't make any sense, then then praise God, that means God's working through us because God uses the foolish ways, come on, to confound the wise. And when he takes somebody and causes us to humble ourselves and put ourselves in a lowly position, all of a sudden we're becoming Jesus to a world that is watching. And they might shake their head at you. They might scoff at you. They might make fun of you. But that doesn't matter. They did that to Jesus. You're doing something right when you're honoring people, when when you're serving people, when you're bringing people with you. You're doing a whole lot of things right. And you're reflecting Jesus to the world around you. That's what it's all about. You've got to fan the gift into flame. You see, the revival that was experienced by Grandma Lois or Mother Eunice, uh, it's not going to go on to impact Timothy's generation unless he fans the gift into flame. It doesn't just happen automatically, church. You can experience a great move of God. But I'm telling you that if we're not deliberate, if we're not intentional about ushering the next generation into the very presence of God, the anointing of God, then we're not going to see future generations experience revival. And what am I talking about revival? What is this? I'm talking about a spiritual awakening. I'm talking about something inside of us that comes alive. Come on, that gets lit up on the inside. And that's what God wants to do. It's not about the form that it takes. It's about the purpose behind it. And the purpose behind it is that God wants there to be life and life to the full. He wants his church, his people to be filled with life. There should be life-giving power in the presence of God's people, and not just in the four walls, but everywhere we go, that we are carriers of revival, bringing life to dead things, dead people, dead places, resurrection power. That's what it's about. But it doesn't happen if Timothy doesn't fan into flame the gift of God. He received the gift, but what he does with it now is critical. What he does with it determines what happens next. In verse 7, we read the description of the spirit that God has given us, a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. We're, many of us are familiar with that passage. Can I tell you what that means for us, though? Here's what it means. It means that having the Holy Spirit means we've moved from being recipients of the church's mission to now being responsible for the church's mission. We've moved out of the place of being recipients when we received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which each and every one of us did when we received Christ into our life. We received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and at that very moment, we moved from being simply recipients of the church's mission to see souls saved, and now all of a sudden we become a part of being responsible for that mission going forward. Now it's our turn to go and make disciples. Once Timothy became a disciple of the Lord Jesus, it became his mission to go and make disciples. And here's the key, empowered by the same spirit as Lois and Eunice. It's the same spirit that empowered his mother. It's the same spirit that empowered his grandmother. It's the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that empowers young Timothy to go forward and to to be a part of the gospel work anointed by God. It's that same spirit. And in the church today, we need adults of all ages to step up to the plate spiritually in the church and become leaders. There is a mantle of anointing, but there is a mantle of leadership, leadership that every single one of us, when we move out of that place of just being a recipient of the mission of the church, and now we're responsible for the mission, Come on, the church is the people of God. It's not a building. It's not a religion. There were some kids who said it in that video pretty well. They understand what the church is. It's us. It's you and it's me together. And we need to be about the business of spreading the gospel. We need to be active. And there is a mantle of leadership that we have to be willing to accept. We have to be willing to accept it. Can I tell you, we talked about it Wednesday night in our Bible study. And if you have not attended either a life group or a Wednesday night Bible study, man, can I encourage you, get plugged in. We had some life-giving conversation Wednesday night in that conference room. And it just blessed my socks off. Just going deep into the Word of God, we started a study on James. And my favorite part of Bible study is when I hear from other people what, how God is, is taking his Word and applying it to their heart and giving them spiritual insights. And it's just an awesome time. This is great. Monologue dialogue is fine. I'm talking at you, but I love when we can sit around a table and have dialogue. There's just no substitute for that, where we can have an exchange of ideas, where questions can be asked, and we may 
have all the answers, but we can wrestle with those things together where we can pray with one another. It's a, it's a special time. And, and I love seeing, especially young people, that room was filled with people of my generation on Wednesday night just sitting around talking about the Word of God. And they're stepping into it. And there's a hunger. There's a hunger that you can just sense. It's, it's palpable in the room. There's a hunger for the things of God. And I'm excited for what's happening in my generation. And it's a result of those generations that have come before us. We have to be actively involved in helping the church grow, both spiritually and numerically. There's a big emphasis on, on numerical growth in the church today. But I'm telling you that if we don't grow spiritually, we've built a wrong foundation. If we just grow numerically and we just have a whole lot of butts and seats, but then Monday through Saturday they're out there living the same way they did before they walked through the doors, then we've not accomplished anything. There needs to be a spiritual foundation, a spiritual heritage. We're not just passing on to the next generation good attendance. We need to be passing on to the next generation what it means to be a disciple, what it means to honor uh, the older generation, what it means to serve, what it means to give, what it means to really love your church and not just attend your church. God's not called us just to be attenders. He's called us to be actively engaged, loving our church, loving the lost, being about the things that God is about. We're called to not be ashamed, bashful, or afraid, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and fan into flame the gift of God to see another generation touched. Can I tell you, you need the touch of the Holy Spirit. You need the touch of the Holy Spirit on your life. You cannot do what God has called you to do without the help of the Holy Spirit. The disciples understood this, uh, Peter especially well, and they, they, they tarried in the upper room in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. They tarried for many, many weeks leading up to Pentecost, praying in unity, singing out to the Father, crying out to him because they knew there was a promise that awaited them, because they knew they could not fulfill the Great Commission without the empowerment of the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you today, we still need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be able to fulfill the Great Commission. If you just want to attend church, then you don't need that. But if you want to go into Walmart and see somebody saved, you do. You need the Holy Spirit to anoint you to go out and to be witnesses in dark places, to be light, to be salt. Spiritual and organizational positions, they get passed down from elders to those younger in the church, and that is what keeps the church alive and growing. There comes a point for all of us where we have to hand the baton over to somebody else. It's critical. If we fail to make that handoff, we can seriously paralyze future generations. That handoff is absolutely critical. We have to get involved. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, get involved. The Old Testament speaks about two men of God uh, named Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah had a mighty ministry. The name Elijah means Jehovah is God, which is awesome in itself. That name, Jehovah is God, that is incredible. He became known as the man who had no fear of man. He preached against sin and stood against those that rebelled against spiritual authority, mainly Jezebel, who would later become queen of Israel, and she was a worshiper of a false god named Baal. We don't know a lot about Elijah's background, but suddenly he appears in the scriptures rebuking the godless and working to restore Israel to God, working to restore God's people to God himself. The Bible points out that he was a fearless, bold, and dauntless reformer. He rebuked kings as well as the common man living in sin. He was a mighty intercessor praying with great faith and intensity. Can I just stop right there and say that for the seasoned saints in the room, one of the best things you can do and one of the things you're best at is interceding, is praying. Man, thank you. We covet your prayers. Thank you for how you pray for us, for the future generations, for your kids and your grandkids. Thank you for the, the prayers of the saints that you, you bathe this church and its leadership in prayer. We so covet that. One of the things I appreciated about my wife's grandfather was every time he talked to us, he said, I pray for you every day, and I knew he meant it. I knew he meant it. I pray for you every day. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. We need that. And so that's what Elijah did. His ministry was marked by these things. He performed miracle after miracle, and he was used mightily by God. He was a man of God, and when he walked into the room, your attention was drawn to him because the Spirit of God rested upon him. When he spoke, you heard God speaking. And one day Elijah was walking along, and he wore a mantle across his chest and over his shoulders, and people recognized him as such from a distance. Elijah had been noticing a young farm boy named Elisha down the road from his house and how this young man served and worshipped the Lord. 
And as he walked along, he came up alongside young Elisha, and he threw his mantle from off his shoulders and onto Elisha's shoulders. And symbolically, he was saying, God is now resting on you. It's time for you to be used by God. There was a, a passing off of the mantle. There was a handing off of that, of that anointing. It was no doubt a fashionable piece of cloth, and it brought special honor to whoever wore it. So the, the item itself was special, but it's more important to understand that it was a physical sign of a supernatural happening, that the anointing of God was now on this man. Oh, he may not stand and preach for a few years, but God was with him. He may not even be mature yet, but, but God sees in his heart and starts working in him at a young age. Can I just say, anointing often precedes preparation? It's true. David was anointed king long before he ever actually sat on that throne. Anointing often precedes preparation. What does that mean? It means that your children at six years old can be anointed of God, and the call of God can be abundantly clear upon their life. When you have spiritual eyes to see like Elijah, when you are intentional about passing a mantle, you can see what God is stirring in the heart of a young person before it comes to fruition. Before they actually step into the call and the position, you can see that there is an anointing, there is a gift, there is a call, there is a mantle. And it takes those of us who are of an older generation, which there's always going to be somebody younger than, than any of us, it takes all of us looking on to that next generation, looking at that young person and saying to God, Holy Spirit, show me what it is that I need to pass on to them to help them fulfill the call on their life. See, Elijah was intentional. Nobody had to come along and say, Elijah, now you know you're getting old and getting a little rusty there, bud, you know, time to probably look for a, a successor. It wasn't like that. Elijah communed with God, and because he was a man of prayer, he could hear the voice of the Lord, and he understood that God was putting his finger on Elisha, and he was saying, it's time, Elijah. And Elijah could have said, oh, but I'm still anointed. Oh, but I'm still flowing in the spirit. Oh, but I'm still gifted. Oh, but people listen to me. I'm effective. And he'd have been right in all of those things. But when God speaks and it's his timing, it's not about invalidating the person who's handing over the mantle. When Elijah handed over the mantle, it didn't mean because it was because he wasn't good enough, because the anointing had left him. No, it's because God understood that there needs to be a transference of the mantle. There needs to be a transference of the anointing because it needs to carry on. Because, see, God knew that Elisha needed Elijah, his support and his tutelage, his mentorship. God knew Elisha needed Elijah for a period of time of preparation so that the anointing would come first, then the preparation, so that when Elisha went into his ministry, he would be successful, he would be fruitful, right? Because God knew there are enemies that are going to come and try to attack. There are Jezebels out there just like Elijah faced, and Elijah had to destroy enemies that stood in the way of God, and he had to clear a path for Elisha. But if he left too early, Elisha would step into that anointing and step into that mantle, in an infancy stage, and can I tell you, that's where the enemy loves to prey upon people, right? In their infancy, when you've just stepped out into something. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? You've stepped into something new. Come on, maybe you're running your own business. Maybe you stepped into ministry. Maybe you moved. Whatever it is, but you've stepped into something new, and you've taken a risk of faith, and all of a sudden, you see the enemy just, boom, come in and try to undercut you. That's how he rolls. And so for those of us who are of an older generation to somebody younger, no matter what stage that is, when we hand over that mantle like Elijah, we have to hang with them for a season of preparation because it's us that actually prepare them. The anointing hasn't left. The mantle hasn't left. God put that upon your life so that you could pour it into the next generation. And that's going to take a period of time. And so it was with Elijah and Elisha. There was a period of years where Elijah was pouring into Elisha's life, speaking into him, supporting, sh showing him by example, being a mentor to him, so that when it came time for Elisha to be on his own, the enemy wouldn't be able to just come in and undercut and take him out. Elijah was not just deliberate about passing the mantle, he was deliberate about that mantle remaining upon Elisha's life so that it would impact the next generation. He, he wasn't... Hear me now. For you seasoned saints who feel like, man, I've done my due diligence. I've, I've served my time. I, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Elijah said, I'm not just checking out. I'm not just, I'm not just, I'm in retirement. I'm going to ride off into the sunset. Elijah understood my responsibility doesn't end when the mantle gets transferred. My responsibility just changes. It just changes. And so we step into different seasons in generations where all of a sudden we realize the anointing is still here, the mantle is still there, but God is using me in a different way. 
And we have to sometimes step aside. You know, some good leadership that I've heard said this, that when you find somebody in ministry who can do the job 60% as well as you can, it's time to hand it over. That's good leadership. That's truth. Why? Because, like I said, anointing precedes preparation. So you're saying, I see the call of God on your life, and you may not be at 100%. You're not where Elijah is right now, but God says there is great potential. And as we're going to read later, there's potential to exceed, to outrun, to go beyond, to get a double portion. Come on, that's what I want. I want the next guy to do way better than I did. Come on, I want to see him propel everybody far further than I was able to. That should be your desire. You want to see your kids outrun you, right? You want to see the next generation outrun you. And it doesn't have to look the same. You just want to see that hunger. You want to see that fire. You say, come on, fan that thing into flame already. Let's go. But when we get married to the model, when we get married to the form of what it looks like, it doesn't have to look like, I'm trading my sorrows. It's a great song. I loved worshiping to it. But it doesn't have to look like that. And it doesn't have to look like whatever modern songs we sing today. And it doesn't have to look like revival did in the 90s. It doesn't have to look like revival did in Pensacola or Canada or, or wherever. But we have to understand that it's about the fire of God that is inside, like a fire shut up in my bones, that it's just gonna, it's got to get out. And when we see that in people's lives, that hunger, that insatiable desire for souls to be saved, all of a sudden, that's what we're looking for. That's the anointing. That's the fire of God. That's the mantle being transferred. We can't get married to the form. We have to, we have to be married to the fire. We got to be married to the fire. Come on, I'm preaching this morning. We got to be married to the fire. That's what it's about. So we need to, while they might not be used for a few years, we need to nurture and train the younger in the ways of God to prepare them for the time that is coming. The fact is, if we don't train them in godliness, the world will train them in ungodliness. And I'm telling you, an anointing can be spoiled. I've seen it. An anointing can be spoiled. It can be set on the shelf, and it, and it mildews, and it molds, and it gets nasty. And when an anointing spoils, it, it often looks like religion. When an anointing and a calling and a mantle of God, when it sits on the shelf too long and it spoils, it often looks like a Pharisee. It's the truth. And so we want people, we want to develop them in godliness. We want to train them in godliness. And, and we talked about this Wednesday night. We don't need to wait until they've been following the Lord for two years. Go to a third world country. You follow the Lord for two minutes. You're, you're engaged. Let's go. Who are you telling about Jesus? Who are you bringing with you? Who are you praying for? Let's go. Heal the sick. Deliver, you know, deliver people. Cast out demons. Like, it's boom right now. There's no waiting. It's activation from the get-go. And that's what it's about. We need to get engaged and not set the call, not set the mantle, not set the anointing on a shelf and let it gather dust. Because that's where we just start to fall into religious rituals. That's where we start to just become that whitewashed tomb that Jesus warns us about. We need to be filled with the fire of God, and we need to be used by him in a powerful way. So Elijah casts this, his mantle over onto Elisha uh, as he was plowing his field. And so we pick that up in 1 Kings 19 and verse 19. It says, so Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, uh, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. I love that. Just like, boom, I'm out. Just walked away. See, this action of casting his mantle upon Elisha was no doubt signifying he was being called into the office of a prophet of God, that Elisha was stepping now into that office. It signified a position of power and favor with God, a mantle of anointing. And the prophet Joel spoke about a mantle that was going to be cast upon a people in the last days. Amen? He talked about that, a great mantle of God's glory and power, a mantle that would bring the anointing and divine position to all those that receive this mantle that we call the Holy Spirit. You see, in the Old Testament, it was limited to a select few individuals who were, who were anointed of God, that the Spirit of God rested upon. But now Joel tells us there's a time that's coming when I'm going to pour my spirit out. My sons and daughters, they're going to prophesy. Come on, old men, young men, dreams, visions, it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's being poured out. There's a mantle, and we see that in Joel 2.28. I will pour out my spirit upon all people. All generations, come on, all, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up 
and he proclaimed to the people there that this mantle of God's spirit wasn't just for a previous generation. He says in Acts 2, 38 and 39, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, your children, and to those who are far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Folks, if you've been born again, there's a mantle that was placed upon you. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with the mantle of God? That when you were saved, when you were born again, you were made a new creation, this mantle came to rest upon your life, and now you're not just a recipient of the mission of the gospel, but now you're responsible for the gospel. What are you doing with the mantle today? It's our responsibility to nurture the mantle and anointing of God and then pass it on to the next generation. It's really simple, folks. It's, it's not complicated. God just says, I want you to receive it, I want you to live it, and then I want you to pass it on. Receive it, live it, pass it on. That's what he's called us to do. Can I tell you that what, what we sometimes do is we receive it and we live it and then we hang on to it forever? I'm telling you, if I don't, if I don't step out of this pulpit the day that God tells me to, I'll be doing all of you a great disservice. I'm speaking first person so that you understand that I take it personally, that, that it's not just about somebody else. I'm not trying to just nudge somebody out of a position. I'm saying somebody, someday God's going to nudge me out of a position. And we have to be willing to step into that because if we, if we occupy a position for too long, if Elijah said, I'm not passing that mantle on to Elisha, he, he's, he's nowhere near ready. I'm not doing it. And I like my role and everybody thinks I'm darn good at it. And he didn't give it up. He would not just be doing Elisha a disservice. He'd be doing all of Israel a disservice. He'd be doing God himself a disservice. Robbing people of the plan of God. When God speaks, when God leads, and sometimes that comes from divine inspiration where the Holy Spirit tells you. And I'm just telling you, there's going to be times where leadership (laughs) says, hey, I really feel like God's saying this, and it's time for us to make a shift. And that happens too. And I've had that happen in my life. And we have to have humble hearts that say, God, you can speak to me. And also you can speak to me through your delegated authority. That that when somebody comes to me with wisdom and anointing and says, I believe this is of the Lord, God, I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm not going to cling to position. Rather, I'm going to cling to your purposes, which is to see that go on to the next generation. So we've got to do everything we can within our power to be intentional about working together to leave a legacy that continues beyond us. Elisha had to follow Elijah around to become his servant, and notice that responsibility fell on the younger, not the older. If you want to be mentored, can I tell you how it doesn't work? Hey, will you mentor me and, like, just, like, call me, like, three times a week and just, you know, like, send me messages and things and just tell me what I need to do? That's not how mentoring works. Elijah's like, no, bub, click. Not doing it. Listen, this is how a a, a mentorship works. If you want to learn from me, then be where I am. If you want to to be like me and and, and you want that anointing and that mantle, then then do what I do. Follow me. Let's go. That's what Jesus did, isn't it? He said, if you you want to be my disciples, then follow me. Leave all that other stuff and, and come follow me. Let's go. He, he didn't sit there and call them and text them and Facebook them and show up knocking on their door. Hey, buddy, you awake yet? You know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to rise and shine and give God the glory. <laughs> a mentor isn't a babysitter to hold your hand. If you want to be mentored in the things of God and you want to step into the anointing and the mantle that God has for you, that's on you, bub. That's on you. You step into that. Because the moment that it was placed on your shoulders, which, again, let me remind you, was when you got saved. When you got saved, there was a mantle placed upon your shoulders. And, and what you do with it from there is on you. It's on you. And if you want, listen, there's, this is the blessing of it. There's no limit. There's no limit. God gives his spirit without measure. And so there's no limit. God's saying, as far as you want to go, come on. He's saying, as much as you want, it's all for you. Come on, I'm going to use you as much as you want to be used by me. And he's not placing limits on us. That's amazing. You know, so we read about in a minute here, Elisha getting a double portion. God, God doesn't even keep us to double. He's going to give you quadruple or ten times. I mean, come on, God, God is not going to put a limit on it. And so Elisha had to follow Elijah around to become his servant, and he did whatever Elijah asked him to do so that when the time came, he would step forward and fill the vacancy that the man of God would leave in Israel. So the younger Elisha watched, he learned, he obeyed, and he didn't, get this, he didn't let anyone or anything hinder his walk with God. 
When you are trying to step into that mantle, that anointing, that call of God, you can't allow anyone or anything to deter you along the way. You better set your face like Flint, buddy. You better really look at Jesus and stare into his eyes because he's the one who's leading you. He's the one who's calling you. And so there will be distractions. There will be things that come in, potential offenses, you know, different, different squabbles, disagreements. We read about it all throughout the New Testament. That's why Paul is continually writing to the churches and trying to establish unity and order because of all of this kind of stuff happening. It happens. If it happened for the apostle Paul, it's going to happen for us. Like, it doesn't mean that, that, that your group is more dysfunctional than another group. I'm telling you, if, if the Apostle Paul had dysfunction within his groups and he knew how to crack the whip, we're going to have some of it, too. We just are. And so if you want to step into the call, though, you can't allow that stuff to distract you and deter you. You have to say, no, I am determined that I'm going to follow after what God has called me to do, and there's nothing that's going to stop me. So Elisha did that. He followed after Elijah and determined that nothing was going to hinder his walk with God. And listen, there's no doubt that Elijah did some things different than Elisha would probably do them. I'm sure they had their fair share of differences, as we all do, especially from generation to generation. Can we be honest that, that generations, right now, we have something like 327 million people living in the United States. And there's something like eight kids that are born every minute. So we are having constant influx into the younger generation while health care is allowing people to live much, much older. The oldest woman alive in America, to my knowledge, is 114 years old. And this means that we are currently living in an era where we have five generations all at the same time. That can create some tension, folks. But it also can create, like I said, a beautiful tapestry of diversity, of how God can use people who are, who are not always in agreement on things, who don't always have the same viewpoint, but God can use that to create a stronger whole than if we were all homogenous, if we all believed the same, thought the same, came from the same generation. We are stronger because of our diversity. If we allow the Holy Spirit, who unites all of us, come on, if you're in the Lord, you can meet somebody who's 30 years your senior or 30 years your junior, but when they have the spirit of the living God living inside of them, you say, man, that's it right there. Like, me and you, we're buds for life because we've got the same spirit of God living inside of us. We're brothers. We're sisters. That's it. That's, that's, that's where it starts. That's where it ends. And so they, I'm sure, have their differences, but no temptations, no offenses, no hardships were worth losing the mantle for Elisha. Let me say that again. No hardships, no offenses, no temptations were worth losing the mantle for Elisha. But can I tell you that Elisha was never in it for himself, right? He wasn't like, I don't want to lose this mantle, man. I'm going to be a star. They're going to put a star down there in Jerusalem, man, on the sidewalk with my name. I'm going to put my footprints in it. That's not why he was doing it, right? He was doing it because it was for other people. He was doing it for people who didn't know Jesus. He was doing it for people because there was a future generation. See, he understood the prophecy. He understood that there was a plan of God, that, that the, the plan of God to, to send his son into the world, it didn't begin in Matthew. It began in Genesis, y'all. And see, the people of God understood there is, a, there is a time coming and there is a fulfillment of the scriptures. There is a fulfillment of prophecy that God is going to redeem all mankind. See, so he understood it's for the salvation of the world that I'm stepping into this story, and it's not about me. I'm not the central figure. God is the central figure of the story, and I'm telling you, when God becomes the central figure of your story, that's when powerful things can happen. You're not living for you. You're living for him, and you're living for people who don't know him. And it's this commitment to valuing generations that the church needs today. We no doubt have our differences, but we have a common goal. We have a common goal. We got to set our eyes on the goal. We got to keep our eyes fixed on the prize that is set before us, that eternal hope, right? That glory of God that he has set before us. That's what it's all about. And we need each other. The younger needs the older to pass down a spiritual legacy. We need the older to pass down wisdom and experience and powerful prayers of intercession. And the older needs the younger to take hold of the mantle and to program their iPhones for them. So... Come on, it's true. You can amen it. It's all right. I, my, my kids are helping me with my smartphone already. I'm like, man, already? They've already, they've already got me licked on that. And can I just tell you, if you're a parent of a, of a tween or a teen, anybody who has a smartphone, you better get schooled on that stuff. You better learn how that stuff works. Because even when you do, they're still running circles around you. 
Uh, best thing is don't even introduce it yet. Like the longer you can keep it out of their hand, the better. That's just a little plug for you moms and dads, a little pastoral counsel. So a few years later in the life of Elijah and Elisha, we find in 2 Kings 2, uh, beginning in verse 9, when they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, please, listen to his prayer, his heart's cry, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. What's that about? If you see me when I'm taken away, then you'll get the double portion. Then you'll get to, to, to fill my spot. But if you're not here when I get taken up, tough luck. What's he saying? He's strongly emphasizing where the responsibility lies. You can ask this of me, but I can't give it to you. You got you to gotta chase after it. You got to have the hunger. You got to have the commitment to it. And if you're not there, come on, how many times might we miss a God moment because we don't show up? I mean, I'll be honest with you. Like before I was a pastor, I didn't want to miss a Sunday morning. Why? Because I thought that could be my God moment. I'm not saying there aren't God moments in my bedroom or in my car, but I'm telling you that there's something powerful about the corporate gathering of the believers that where the Spirit of God is dwelling there. And I just say, man, it doesn't take me filling a pulpit or a position to want to be faithful to the house of God. It says, it's me saying, I don't want to miss out on my God moment. This could be the moment of my miracle. This could be the moment of my mantle. This could be the moment where the anointing comes down. This could be the moment where I step into my destiny and my purpose. But you have to be living for somebody other than yourself in order to have that mentality. And Elijah is stressing this with Elisha. If you really want it, then you're going to be here for it. And if you're not here for it, then don't start crying about how you missed it. Elisha could have asked for fame, money, influence, physical strength, but he asked for a double portion of Elijah's anointing on his life. See, like Solomon, Elisha didn't ask for anything of this world, but he asked for more spiritual power that he might be used effectively for the Lord. Have you ever seen where a kid will, for Christmas, say, Mom, I don't want any presents. I just want to give money to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation or whatever. You know, it, it's like, wow. I mean, those kind of moments are just like, okay, I need to repent right now. You know, like <laughs> sometimes kids get it better than we do. It's not about me getting more gifts and me getting more stuff and me getting more whatever for status. It's about me putting other people first. Sometimes kids... They have it figured out where us adults get a little bit confused, right? We size each other up when we meet each other. So what do you do for a living? You know, like try to figure out, hey, how, how big of a man are you? You know, how big's your pocketbook? What kind of a truck do you drive? You know, just ridiculous stuff. But, but kids, man, they get it. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's about worshiping God. It's about serving him with your life and laying yourself down for somebody else. Just like Elisha, we need to pray and believe for a double portion anointing to be passed on to the next generation of young people in the church, amen? We need to be believing for that. We need to step into it first because you can't pray for it for somebody else if you're not walking in it because we got to live it by example. I'm telling you, kids aren't going to do what you say. They're going to do what you do. Elijah didn't say, do what I say. Elijah said, follow me around and do what I do. The process of mentorship in Scripture uh, was about tying, literally tying yourself to somebody so that I'm bound to you, and wherever you go, I go. I don't have a choice anymore. I've made a commitment. I'm bound to you. And so it's not about all the, how, good you can, how good of a game you can talk. It's not about how well you can speak Christianese. Some of us are pretty darn good at speaking Christianese. You might be darn near fluent. It doesn't matter how, how well you speak the lingo. It matters how well you live the life. And your kids and your grandkids, they're not going to have a legacy to inherit just because of all the stuff you say. I don't care how many books you read. It doesn't matter. It's about how are you living the most basic, simple truth of the gospel? Are you living it out? Because your kids will only go as far as you go. You're setting the bar for them. But there is an anointing where they can surpass you if you'll help them to dream for bigger. What did Jesus say? He said, even greater things will you do. What was he doing? He was raising the bar. He was saying, don't use me as the standard. Jesus, don't use me as the standard. Don't don't limit yourself to what I've done. He's saying, you're going to go beyond because now you're going to have the Holy Spirit. You're going to have the anointing of God resting upon you and in you, and you're going to be multiplied all over the earth. And what you do is going to exceed what I've done in my life. Jesus took the limits off. He raised the bar. We've got to do that for the next generation. But we can only do it if our words and our deeds are in sync. They've got to be in sync. 
you know, I had a somewhat new perspective this last Wednesday night as your pastor, and it just blessed my heart in a powerful way. Um, man, it almost had me just welling up with tears. I, you know, so, so you guys know our foster journey. We've got a couple little girls that we just love to death. And, and so Wednesday night was the first Wednesday back for our midweek programming. So if you don't know, we've got programs for every age and stage from little bitty all the way up to grandmas and grandpas. And so we, we, it's called family night. We just meet together in our individual classes. We study the word of God and build community with one another. And it's a powerful time. And so after the adult Bible study in the conference room, um, concluded, I went over to the kids' building along with many of the other parents, and uh, again, this is kind of new for us, and so I've been here about three years now, uh, but we had teenagers, one who came with us, the other one had gone straight to college when we came, and so I, I didn't really have the benefit of passing through the halls um, at that time. Sometimes I'd come over maybe 20 minutes after dismissal, but by then it had pretty well cleared out. I got to see, man, that building is filled with life life. It is teeming with life over there on Wednesday nights. And if you don't come Wednesday nights, can I tell you, it's just, it's full of not just the kids you've seen this morning. It's probably filled triple to quadruple of that with kids that don't attend, their families don't attend Sunday mornings. What a blessing that we have as a church to be able to speak into the lives of families who may not even call this place home yet, yet. And walking through that building and just, can I, I just want to say thank you to everybody who serves uh, our children in this, in this church. Thank you for those of you who are investing in kids. Yeah. In the young people, in the teenagers, just going through. I was just overwhelmed with gratitude uh, just for the way that you, you serve. And now we're seeing the fruit in our own home. We're seeing, you know, we're reaping the benefits of it, of all those seeds that you're sowing. Uh, it is not in vain. It's, it's awesome what God is doing. And so, um, you know, I'm telling you, there's a spiritual heritage. It's already being passed down. I'm seeing it out there. I'm seeing the heritage being passed down. And sometimes, and it ought not be this way, and it's not God's purpose to do it this way, but sometimes it skips a generation. <clears throat> sometimes we get frustrated because, well, I want, what about their mom and dad? Maybe, just maybe, little Billy is going to be the one who wins his dad to the Lord. Right? Right? Maybe little Susie, maybe she's the one who's going to lead her mom to the Lord. Maybe it's not going to happen tomorrow. Maybe it's going to be a few years from now. But God has a plan, and I'm going to sow seeds wherever I can. I know some people who say, I don't do VBS. That's just babysitting. I'll take it. I'll take it. Come on. I'm going to watch some kids that aren't even my own because I want to sow seeds into their lives. Like, I'll babysit somebody else's kids. Give me 70 of them. 75, that's what we had over the summer. We'll take it. Give us a few days to speak into their life and to pour the gospel into them, to introduce them to Jesus. I'll take it. I don't care what you call it. We got, we got parents dropping kids off Wednesday nights, and they go out, and I don't know what they do. For all I know, they're at the bar. I'll take your kid. I don't care where. I mean, whatever you're doing is your business, but I got your kid, and for that hour and a half, we're going to speak the truth of the gospel into them, the peace of God that surpasses understanding, that no matter what kind of a home life and environment they go back to, God's going with them. God's going with them. They're not going back by themselves. And so I'm going to take it. Everything that they'll give us, we'll take it. There's a spiritual heritage that's being passed down. There's a foundation that's being built into children's lives. There's a legacy that will continue on for a generation to be impacted by the Spirit of God. You know, this church was founded on prayer. This church was founded upon an older man who had plowed fields for years and years and years. Someday, I'm believing we're going to have a plaque outside that's going to tell the story of this church's history. But that sucker's expensive, I'm just saying. And... I've looked into it. I, I drew it up. I, I can't, can't get there yet, but we'll get there. If you want to give to it, just come see me. And uh, this man's name was Orville Backins, and some of y'all have told us the story about Orville, and I looked into his life, and, and uh, he's a great man of God, and, and he prayed, and he contended. He did warfare in the spirit, believing for a spirit-filled evangelical church to be planted in Grundy County. And to my knowledge, to this day, we're the only one of its kind. And we're a pretty ge big geographic county. And so I, I, I say that to say, man, it was because there was a man of prayer who said, it's important to me that something is left for future generations. He didn't get to see it. Like, he didn't get to benefit from it. He didn't get to be a, a member and a tender. He, he only prayed for it, believed for it, and then on down the line, I believe after he had even moved out of state, then the church was established and it began to flourish and grow. But it was all the result of one man's prayers. Will you be willing to pray for things that you might never see? You know, when you're a person of prayer, you, you have the proof in your heart before you ever have to see it with your eyes. 
you know that God spoke it. You know that God purposed it in his heart. And if he purposed it in his heart, it's going to come to pass. All you got to do is continue to pray, continue to intercede, continue to stand in the gap. It may not happen for a few years or it might start happening next week, but a mantle of God's power needs to fall upon the next generation. And it's up to all of us to nurture them, to guide them, to instruct them in the ways of God. And I'm so thankful for everybody, like I said, that faithfully serves here each and every week. As I said earlier, Elijah's name meant Jehovah is God, but Elisha's name went a step further. It means Jehovah has become my salvation. Elisha surpassed Elijah in many ways. See, it's a good thing to know God, but it's better when he becomes your savior. That's where everything changes because now it's personal. Now it's personal. And when it's personal, when it radically changes and transforms who you are, that's something that sticks with you. That's where you have the why behind the what. See, Elisha didn't need to ask Elijah why, why, why. Elisha understood God is my savior. Jehovah is my savior. He had a why that went beyond the what that he saw Elijah doing. There was a why that fueled his purpose. We have to have that why. When Jesus becomes our savior, we have our why. We have our purpose. It has become personal for us. Elisha was very different from Elijah and in many ways better. Elijah was a prophet in the wilderness, but Elisha was a prince in the king's courts. Elijah had no home to settle down, but Elisha enjoyed peace in his home. Elijah's ministry was one of stern rebuke and condemnation, but Elisha was mainly one of teaching and winning the lost. Elijah was a rebuker of kings, but Elisha was a friend and was admired by kings. Doesn't mean he compromised, but he had favor. Elijah preached with fire and full of vengeance, but Elisha was a messenger of God's mercy and love. Elijah was energetic and fierce, but Elisha was gentle, compassionate, and simple. Elijah was a lone, solitary figure, but Elisha was more social and a part of the community. Elijah was full of God's power, but Elisha had a double portion of God's power. Again, in the Old Testament, only those of the tribe of Levi and his descendants were allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies and experience the full power of God. But when Jesus died on Calvary, there was a curtain that was torn by supernatural hands, and now everyone has access into the presence and power of God. I've often believed that this is a wonderful image. It's a wonderful symbol of the faith. But but there's times that that I think maybe this is better. I might upset some generations right there. It's a black curtain. What are you talking about? Darkness is of the devil. No, I'm saying the curtain, it was torn. The curtain was torn. The curtain was torn. Come on, the cross is where Jesus died, but he didn't stay there because there was a curtain that was torn that now I got access. I got access. I don't have to be a Levite and and be a priest to get into the Holy of Holies. I have access to the presence and power of God because of a torn curtain. So sometimes I wonder maybe if a better symbol is instead of having a cross around my neck, it'd be just to do the Hulk Hogan, just tear my shirt, you know. I've got access. Just get nuts. I've got to keep you awake. i got to keep you listening. i got to keep you laughing. Some of you looking at me crazy. It's okay. It's okay. I love you. Good grief. So Elijah and Elisha, the double portion. And so uh, Elijah, man, he did an amazing thing helping Elisha step into the call and the mantle of God on his life. The gift that he left in Elisha and for the future generations, even on down to us, is irreplaceable. And God is a rewarder. There are going to be times in your life where you don't know that it's being recognized. You don't know that it's being appreciated. You don't know that, that people are standing up and taking notice, and maybe they're not. But I'm telling you that God sees all of it. He sees all of it, and he counts all of it, and one day it's all going to count. One day it's all going to count, and God is our rewarder. And so, you know, again, like Orville Backens, we don't have to see the result in this life. Like Elijah, we don't have to see the result in this life, but we contend for what is, is yet to come because God has spoken it. It will come to pass, and it's not about my status or what people say about me. Everyone. Everyone, everyone now has access to the power and presence of God. Everyone, because the bottom line is Christ's body involves every generation. We're the body of Christ. It involves every generation, every generation, every single one of us. We're all valuable. We all matter. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come up. Everyone, everyone can have the mantle fall on them, their children and their grandchildren. Everyone can have the hand of God upon their life. It's a promise. It's in Joel. It's for for you and your children and for all who are far off. It's available. 
The Holy Spirit's available to us. And again, for those of us that are in Christ Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. And we have a great spiritual duty, a duty to the generation that preceded us to pass the mantle on, mantle of faith to the generation that will come after us. We have a duty. We have a responsibility in that. I want to close with this scripture. It says in Psalm 145, 3 and 4, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. Let them proclaim your power. What if that became your prayer? Oh God, let them proclaim your power. From generation to generation, let them proclaim your power. I believe that what, that's what God wants our prayer to be this morning. God, from generation to generation, let them proclaim your power. I'm going to ask you if you would just to stand to your feet, if you're able. And we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to have the worship team, they're going to lead us in another oldie. And, uh, and we're going to close in prayer. And I believe what the Lord wants us to do is to pray intergenerationally in the altar to pray for the younger, to pray for the older, and to pray that prayer, Lord, let them proclaim your power. Let them proclaim your power, older and younger. And I believe God wants us to be intentional about creating a relationship with somebody of a different generation. That's my challenge to you, so I don't forget to issue it. My challenge to you, be intentional about creating a relationship with someone of a different generation. We need that. We talked a few weeks back about knitting those strong ties of love. That's not just within our own generation. We've got to knit strong ties of love with the older and the younger, and we've got to all be knitted together. And so the worship team is going to lead us in this oldie, and we're going to worship God, and then we're going to close in a time of intergenerational prayer right here in this altar. So worship team, would you guys lead us? I want to take your word and shine it all around. But first help me just to live in love. And when I'm doing well, help me to never seek a crown. For my reward is bringing glory.
So here's what I'd like to do if we could have, if you're 50 or older, if you guys would, I'd like to have you come stand across the front of the platform and just face out to the congregation. If you're 50 or older, come on. I seen my man Gary hopping in here today with a new spring in his step. He said, I've been going to the Y. <laughs> I'm telling you. Gary can do laps around me. That man's a hard worker, for real. The other group that I'd like to include in this line is if you are the exception to your generation and somehow before 50, you've become a grandparent, which happens, would you join this group? If you're a grandparent, you're under 50. We're, we're lumping you in. I'm probably going to be there with you someday. I'm 40, and I, yeah, my daughter's getting married in January, so... Megan can't wait to be a, a Mimi or a Gigi. What do we say we we're going to be? Gigi? Yeah. You can join whatever group you want, Stacia. All right, all right. And then the rest of you, if you would fill in just kind of facing this group, giving them an appropriate bubble, com you know, comfort bubble. Just come face them. This is going to be a time of prayer. And here's what, what we're going to do. We're going to pray that there is a mantle, that there is a spiritual transference. We're going to pray that God's going to take the spiritual legacy and impart it to another generation and not just stop with them, but it's going to go on to their children's children and on down through generations. That we're going to leave an impact for the faith, for the kingdom. And we're going to pray that prayer out of Psalm 145. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. Let them proclaim your power. Come on, seasoned saints, we honor you. We thank you for your service. We need you to lay hands. We need you to pray powerful prayers. We need you to impart to the next generation. And our heart's cry is Psalm 145. We want to see our children and our children's children tell of these mighty acts and proclaim your power. Proclaim your power. So we're just going to ask if you would lay hands. Just, it's biblical, man. We're just going to touch a shoulder, an arm, a back. There's no pushing, no shoving. We're just following the biblical model of transference. Come on, we're going to see a mantle placed upon these Elishas right now. So, Elijahs, would you lift your voice? Come on, let's begin to play, pray specifically over that person in front of you. Come on, call them by name if you know their name. Begin to declare the purposes of God over their life, that they will proclaim his power to their children and their children's children. 
Father, we thank you today, Lord, God, that you're not done. God, that what you've established here in 1984, God, it continues. It continues on for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, even 100 until you tarry, whatever it is, Lord God. But we want to see, God, ground taken for your kingdom. But God, we want to see lives transformed. We want to see souls saved. We want to see children and grandchildren impacted. God, we want to see whole families won to you, Jesus. God, we thank you for the mantle, God, that has been carried well. But God, I ask, Lord, for a transference. I ask, Lord, that the mantle would be transferred onto the Elishas in the house today, oh God. God, that they would sense there is an anointing, there's a call upon their life because the Holy Spirit dwells within them. And God, that they would step into that call, they would step into that mantle. And God, I pray during this season of preparation for their lives, God, that you would pour into them. God, through the older, pour into them that they would be mentored. God, that they would be guided. They'd be supported, oh God. God, we thank you for the wisdom. We thank you, Lord God, for the experiences that we can glean from the Elijahs in our house. And God, I pray for each Elisha, Lord, God, that we would inherit that, that we would receive, God, a double portion. God, even quadruple, whatever it is, God, multiplied in our lives. God, that we could see the impact for your kingdom be multiplied. God, we want to come before your throne one day and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And God, we want to have something to present to you. So God, we give you glory. God, we thank you, Lord, for revival. We thank you for years gone by. We thank you for a move of your spirit. We thank you for every salvation and every inheritance spiritually that's been passed down, Lord God, over the years. But God, we declare that greater things are yet to come. We declare that our greatest days lie before us and not behind us, oh God. So Lord, we press on. We press on. We press on, oh God. And we run the race. We run the race, God, with others in mind. We run the race, God, wanting to finish well. We choose to set our face like flint upon you today, oh God. And God, we determine in our hearts that there is nothing that's going to distract us, nothing that's going to deter us from following after the call of God on our life and God walking with that mantle. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to anoint, continue to use our seasoned saints, continue to use the Elijahs in this house in a powerful way. God, we lift you up, and our heart's cry is that they, God, they, every single generation, they would declare your power. They would declare your power from generation to generation to generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.